welcome to the course of uh, introduction to fluid mechanics and fluid engineering. Uh, this particular course uh, will be spread into various lectures and uh, today we will uh, have the lecture 1. Uh, before uh, going into the course, I think what is important for all of us is to recognize that there is a motivation behind learning fluid mechanics. So, we will first go through a few examples that will illustrate us the motivation and uh, then we will get into uh, the fundamental topics that we intend to cover. Now, uh, fluid mechanics is almost everywhere in human life and let me give you some examples to illustrate uh, what are the important applications of fluid mechanics. Uh, let us think of automobiles. Uh, when we think of automobiles, uh, I mean automobiles are the basic elements which many times motivate young minds to study fluid mechanics and really uh, there is uh, a whole lot of challenge in designing automobiles based on the requirements of fluid mechanics, based on the constraints given by some considerations of fluid mechanics. For example, uh, if you want to design a car, design the shape of a car, the shape of a car should be such that it should minimize the drag force or the resistance force. We will come into what is drag force and how it can be minimized later on in our course, but it gives one of the important motivations. Uh, now, when we think of uh, vehicles, uh, uh, not just automobiles which run on land are important, but we have also watercrafts, boats and ships and as you can see here in these uh, visualizations that there can be nice flow. Uh, patterns, the very interesting flow patterns that can be generated as the watercrafts are propelling in water and uh, there can be again a whole lot of analysis that, go, that can go on uh, in the background to make sure that one can minimize the resistances against uh, the motion of the watercraft. Now, uh, <coughs> We come to a third example which deals with spacecrafts. Spacecrafts are uh, uh, the most fascinating of all the examples that we intend uh, to highlight and you can clearly see that uh, uh, let us say that when an aircraft is uh, taking off or landing or when a space shuttle is moving. So, you can see nice visualization of flow. And this nice visualization of flow is a very natural way of visualizing the flow. So, what is happening is that the smokes or products of combustion are coming out and these are basically uh, highlighting the flow patterns that uh, are surrounding the aircraft or the spacecraft. So, this is a very nice way of visualizing the flow not just qualitatively, but one can get uh, quantitative insight on the details of the fluid flow that is taking place and again the very basic principles of motion of uh, these aircrafts or spacecrafts rely on fluid mechanics. Many times uh, again the issue of not just a drag force, but a lift force that is important because the lift force uh, pulls the aircraft up in the sky and uh, many times one may you one may need to use fundamental considerations like uh, say law of uh, conservation of linear momentum and uh, some other basic principles or Newton's laws of motion and uh, uh, some modified versions of these which can be used for fluid, fluid flow analysis. Uh, now, uh, similar uh, to the concept of uh, flow around uh, automobiles and watercrafts and aircrafts, uh, we can have interesting uh, interaction between fluid flow and sports balls. And uh, all of us experience that sports balls under certain conditions can spin or can swing 
and uh, there is a interesting fluid dynamics that goes behind the swing or spin of sports balls. It is a uh, very involved topic and in one of the lectures later on in this course we will discuss in details about the sports ball dynamics. Uh, coming to the material world, uh, I mean the, in engineering we deal with lots of industries and industries uh, uh, many times are basically comprising various plants, power plants and process plants for example. So, you can see that uh, there can be interesting flow patterns that can be observed uh, because of emissions of products of combustion from the chimney that you can see in one case and uh, maybe also uh, similar flows can be visualized in, in process plants as well like effluent treatment plants. Uh, now, fluid dynamics it is, is not just in the material world of automobiles and power plants and process plants like that. Fluid dynamics is there in nature and it is such a beautiful uh, pattern or gallery of patterns of fluid flow that can be visualized if we really observe nature in a vivid way. And what you can see here is that uh, in, in tornadoes, in rivers, in raindrops, uh, what interesting flow patterns can be observed. Now, nature is not just made of inanimate objects. So, there are animate objects like animals and uh, you can see interesting flow around butterflies, snake, fish and all these uh, uh, are really giving rise to very intriguing fluid patterns or fluid flow patterns uh, which can be observed in nature. Uh, now, when we discuss about nature, uh, I mean we basically come into the domain of biological sciences and or life sciences and uh, one of the important follow ups is uh, science of human bodies or science of living systems or medical science. So, you uh, the human body for example, uh, is a paradise for fluid mechanists to make their own analysis for studying the respiratory system, pulmonary system, cardiovascular system, swimming of sperms and uh, uh, all these uh, are very intricate and if one gets a complete understanding of this it uh, gives rise to uh, the, uh, not only a fundamental physical insight, but also maybe strategies to combat various life threatening diseases. And uh, I will just give you one example to illustrate the complications involved. Like uh, let us think of flow of blood through arteries and veins, right? this is a very common thing in, in human body mechanics. Now, think of an analog in a uh, industrial system like flow of water through pipes. Now, uh, can you tell what are the basic differences between flow of water through pipes and flow of uh, blood through arteries and veins? You will immediately come up with some obvious differences like blood is a much more complex fluid uh, than water, but the complexity of blood as a fluid is uh, not a mystery now. I mean it is uh, somewhat uh, appreciated and understood not to the fullest extent, but uh, uh, to some extent it has been well understood. But the problem is that it is not just uh, the issue of blood as a complex fluid, but think of blood vessels. These blood vessels are flexible, their diameters vary with local blood pressure and till now it is a mystery in fundamental science that how the diameter of a blood vessel should vary with locally with blood pressure. And this is not yet fundamentally completely understood. I mean one can go through empirical formula to uh, express this, but it is not a uh, it is not 
yet fundamentally well understood. So, you can well appreciate that an apparently an elusively simple problem like flow of blood through arteries and veins can give rise to very complicated considerations in fluid dynamics. Now, uh, coming from human body mechanics to something let us as an uh, consider as an example of uh, not so humanistic like uh, nuclear explosion. So, you can uh, see an example like of the flow that is taking place because of nuclear exp uh, explosion in the view graph that is being presented. And uh, uh, then like uh, when there is a fluid uh, there is also uh, an interacting structure that is interacting with the fluid. Uh, so, uh, there is often a very interesting interaction between fluid and structure and critical situations may occur when there is a fluid let us say wind blowing past a bridge uh, uh, with an imposed frequency that imposed frequency matches with the natural frequency of the structure. Then there is something called as resonance and because of this resonance the structure may oscillate or vibrate vigorously and there can be failure of the structure. In this example, the bridge has totally collapsed and it will, uh, eventually it is going to collapse in, in this figure, uh, in, in this view graph and uh, that collapsing of the bridge, collapsing of the structure is because of uh, the intricate interaction between the fluid and the structure. So, fluid structure interaction is also a very important and interesting modern day topic. Uh, uh, let us come to more common day to day examples like uh, food or drinks. Uh, of course, we need to understand that uh, uh, I mean this issue we will discuss later on that sometimes it is very uh, difficult to demarcate between a food and a drink right. Uh, whether it is a fluid or it is a solid or it is something in between fluid and solid uh, these kind of questions come and hard demarcations are many times difficult. For example, gel like matters. Now, what we call them should we call them fluids, should we call them uh, solids. Uh, I mean uh, of course, there are very standard descriptions and theories to describe these, these matters, but uh, these are important and interesting topics in fluid mechanics and which deal with the constitutive behavior or the behavior of the substance as, uh, as, as it is and uh, uh, typically it belongs to the study of rheology of fluid flows. Uh, even something not so fluid. Now, looking into this particular view graph that is being shown, can you tell what does it represent? Yes, you are correct. It is a traffic. So, uh, if you visualize the traffic from uh, altitude, uh, you will see that the traffic in a typical city will be moving like this. So, traffic flow although it is not the physical flow of a fluid has some resemblance with the physical flow of a fluid and there is a lot of research that is currently going on and has in the past been going on in the area of traffic flow. Uh, now, the issue is that uh, should we study fluid mechanics just because there are so many applications in, in the industry, in the nature uh, and so on, but sometimes we may study fluid mechanics just because we are fascinated with beautiful flow patterns. So, uh, you can see these examples, these flow patterns which are being demonstrated here. These flow patterns are so interesting and uh, uh, so fascinating that if one is interested to study the uh, structures of these flow patterns uh, and demonstrate these flow patterns through experiments, uh, it is uh, uh, like fluid mechanics gives us a structured way of understanding these patterns. So, uh, uh, to summarize this uh, uh, the discussion that we had had so far we can conclude that fluid mechanics is everywhere. Fluid mechanics is not just uh, uh, in inanimate objects or in animals 
but fluid mechanics is everywhere in the world. So, uh, there is a lot of motivation in studying and understanding fluid mechanics. Now, when we say fluid mechanics is everywhere and we have given certain examples, the examples that uh, we have given so far uh, are uh, somewhat traditional. Now, we can give uh, some more examples where fluid mechanics in a different way is relevant for modern day applications. Like the first example that I want to give you is cooling of microchips through fluid flow and phase change. The motivation of this is as follows. Uh, as we have uh, come to the modern era, what we find is that uh, the sizes of the electronic devices are getting smaller and smaller. Despite the fact that sizes of the electronic devices are getting smaller and smaller, the power dissipation uh, uh, is not getting progressively reduced. So, what it means is that the power den dissipation per unit volume is getting significantly increased because of reduction in volume and that makes the devices overheated. So, you may not be surprised to know that many of the electronic devices actually fail not because of the failure in electronic design, but failure in thermal design. That is those uh, materials cannot withstand that high temperature. So, how can we address this? Of course, you may say that we can employ a fan, but yes, we have to understand that if we have a small miniaturized device, your entire pur purpose of miniaturization will be lost if you have a very small device and to cool that small device you require a large fan. So, you require a compatible cooling arrangement. So, what you can do? You can for example, employ various strategies. One particular strategy is you can employ change of phase. So, you can have a liquid which takes heat from hot spots of the electronic device and can change its phase. The liquid can flow through a micro channel which is a very small channel, a channel of the order of micrometer dimensions and then uh, uh, th when this liquid gets evaporated, the evaporated fluid moves to a different place in the channel and can get condensed. So, there can be an evaporation condensation simultaneously going on to complete the loop and uh, this uh, mechanism is used in I even uh, industrial applications. This is known as uh, heat pipe and in a miniaturized environment, this is known as micro heat pipe. So, there is a lot of interesting fluid mechanics that goes behind. Uh, we do not have scope for discussing that at this moment, but it is just to let you know that these kinds of interesting applications do exist. There is also uh, another technology which is called as droplet based microfluidics. So, what you can do? Basically, you take small droplets, you arrange for small droplets and these droplets will go and sit on hot spots on the electronic device and absorb heat, absorb heat from that hot spot. And uh, so, it is very interesting to design uh, the movement of droplets, so that they can move in an optimal path and in the shortest time they go and sit on the right hot spot and take away heat from that hot spot. We have to understand that fluid dynamics is so interdisciplinary as a subject that it is not a subject just uh, within the jurisdiction of mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, aerospace engineering, civil engineering like that. If you are interested to design an optimal path and make chips for uh, transmission of the droplet according to that optimal path design, then uh, you require to interface with electrical engineers and computer scientists. So, uh, it is really emerging as an interdisciplinary subject. Now, uh, I will give you a couple of more, I will give you a couple of I will give you a couple of more interesting applications and these applications essentially deal with 
uh, healthcare engineering. Now, what is healthcare engineering? Healthcare engineering is an interface of healthcare with engineering and let us see that how fluid mechanics uh, plays a role uh, towards that. So, in healthcare engineering uh, many times what we require is rapid diagnosis of a disease and this is a classical problem, uh, it is a problem relevant in many countries uh, especially in the underdeveloped countries that you know that uh, let us say that a person is suspected to have a certain disease. Now, uh, the person cannot go to a pathological laboratory because he does not he or she does not have access to uh, high, high class pathological laboratories. So, uh, uh, it takes time uh, to take the blood sample let us say as an example and that blood sample is uh, tested in a sophisticated laboratory. By that time the result of that test comes and it is quite expensive to get the result of the test and it is time consuming and by the time the result of the test comes the patient may be under very serious condition. So, as an alternative one can go for various technologies. So, one can have small devices which are called as lab on a chip or a device which is like a rotating disc that is called as lab on a CD. It is like the compact disc of, uh, uh, of uh, for external data storage in, in, in a computer. So, uh, what we can do is you can have micro channels or small channels uh, cut in the disc and you put a droplet of blood just a small droplet of blood not a huge volume of blood drawn from the patient and uh, then you spin the disc in a small in a small motor and uh, that is a portable system. So, that can be taken to the patient itself this is called as point of care uh, way of handling uh, medical diagnostics and then this blood sample is dropped and then uh, within the channels there are various reactants and because of reactions there can be uh, for example, change of color of the blood sample and a particular change of color can give rise to the indication of a particular disease. And here fluid mechanics comes in a big way because you need to have a proper design of what is the rotational speed of the compact disc for most efficient transport of the blood sample. So, this is one example there can be several other examples given. And then once the test result comes immediately this test result uh, can be conveyed to a medical doctor may be through SMS uh, in, in, in the mobile uh, phone system and then uh, the medical doctor can immediately advise for a treatment and this entire process can take place within a few minutes and it is uh, so it is very rapid it is inexpensive it is portable and if this kind of uh, system uh, uh, comes into the market it can really solve some of the challenging problems in uh, medical diagnostics in uh, many places in the world. Uh, another example like uh, which is related to the medical sciences is DNA hybridization and DNA hybridization basically refers to uh, like uh, identification of a particular sequence of bases in a DNA which can indicate the existence of a certain disease. Like uh, all of us know that DNA is a linear polymer made up of a sequence of repeating units known as nucleotides and each monomer is composed of a phosphate group uh, which is schematically shown in the view graph. Uh, which is responsible for a negative charge on the DNA, a uh, deoxyribose sugar and a nitrogen containing base. So, there are four uh, uh, different bases found in DNA A, T, C and G. So, if you want to identify a particular disease it may be related to the sequence of base a particular sequence of bases like 
A A T T G G C C like that, and it is known that A and T want to get combined with the help of hydrogen bond, and G wants to get combined with C with the help of hydrogen bond. So A is complementary to T, and G is complementary to C. So if you want to identify whether a particular sequence of DNA uh, bases is present in a DNA sample, then what you can do? You can put a complement of that interrogating sequence on the wall of a small channel and pump a DNA sample with single strands. So what you can do is that first you break the cell which is called a cell lysis and bring the DNA out of it and then you heat the DNA sample. So, that double stranded DNA gets broken into single strands and then you pass the sample through a fluid flow. So, you, when you pass the sample through a fluid flow, there is an interesting interaction between fluid dynamics and the transport of DNA and that can control effectively that how fast you can uh, achieve this hybridization reaction. And if you can achieve this hybridization reaction fast, then it is possible to uh, like uh, get an answer whether a particular DNA sample uh, 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 base sequence is there in a DNA sample or not and a rapid diagnosis of certain diseases can be made. Uh, next example is to track the dynamics of a biological cell. Now biological cell is a very interesting uh, object in general. And uh, there are several motivations of studying biological cells in a small confinement. In human bodies, there are hierarchical structures of blood vessels. You have large arteries, large veins, small arteries, small veins, arterioles, venules, and microcapillaries. The microcapillaries are of the order of micrometer dimensions, and cells are also of the order of micrometer dimensions, like typical length scale of a cell in a human body may be around uh, 10 micron. So when these cells are moving through human bodies, uh, let, let us say, the, let us think of a challenging problem of like uh, how to understand cancer progression. So it, one of the lethal stages of cancer progression comes when a cancer cell from its origin moves to a distant location within the human body cutting across, I mean move, not cutting across, moving across the blood vessels. So when, when it moves across the blood vessels, uh, it has to also move through microcapillaries. And there is a tremendous resistance that uh, comes from fluid dynamic considerations for moving against moving of cells uh, through microcapillaries. Despite that, cancer cells are able to survive under the, that stressful condition where normal cells are not able to survive. So can fluid dynamics give an answer to this question that why cancer cells can survive effectively in a microfluidic confinement where the normal cells are not able to do. So there are several possible answers and some of the answers, I am not going into the answer, this is not a, a research presentation. So I am not going into the answer to this question or possible answer to this question. I am just giving you some clues where fluid dynamics find its relevance in this application. So the cell membrane, if you look into the cell, the cell membrane uh, in its composition is somewhat fluidic in nature. So the fluidity of the cell membrane has something to do with the malleability of the cell and the manner in which a cell membrane can control its fluidity based on that it depends on whether a cell membrane can uh, whether a cell can adapt or adjust its shape effectively to withstand a stressful condition and a cancer cell possibly does it in a much more better way than a normal cell so that is how a cancer cell survives in a stressful condition and uh, uh, it is a very important and interesting area of research because if one understands the a uh, proper fluid dynamic mechanism that goes in and around, around the cancer cell uh, which uh, controls the adaptation of cancer cell, then possibly 
newer and newer drugs can be discovered that can inhibit the survival capacity of cancer cells in a stressful environment. Uh, coming from a biological example, uh, uh, I will give you uh, another example which is uh, which does illustrates that fluid dynamics can be multiphysics. So, multiphysics means that uh, you uh, just do not require only fluid physics or only flow physics. The flow physics may be may need to be combined with electricity, uh, uh, electro hydrodynamics, magneto hydrodynamics that is electrical sciences or electromagnetic theory or sometimes optics. So, this is called as multiphysics, where physics from multiple disciplines need to be converged together to solve a fluid dynamics problem. Like uh, uh, let us look into this slide, where we intend to show that you can bend water or move water by using light. So, what is the strategy? Briefly the strategy is as follows, you uh, coat the surface of a channel. Uh, with a metal oxide semiconductor, say titanium dioxide or zinc oxide and you shine ultraviolet li light on that. So, when you shine ultraviolet light on that, so uh, because of the typical energy gap, you have uh, it is compatible uh, energies that is provided by the uh, ultraviolet radiation and immediately electron hole reactions will start. So, based on that the surface will either acquire a positive charge or a negative charge depending on whether it will have excess holes or excess electrons. I am not going to the exact details what happens in this specific case, but the net effect is that the surface energy gets altered. Because the surface energy gets altered, a surface which was earlier disliking water may start liking water that is from so called hydrophobic it becomes hydrophilic and water will move into that direction. So, you do not require a physical pump to drive water, you just require a source of light to drive water and uh, uh, you can even bend water by light. Uh, I will come to another very fascinating example just to illustrate uh, the uh, kind of uh, importance that fluid dynamics may have not just in medical diagnostics, but also in medical uh, treatment so, or in a combined package of diagnostics and treatment. So, we can think of uh, like uh, a injection for sucking blood for testing the blood sample for example, maybe for testing for sugar level in a diabetes patient. And then uh, transferring insulin to the same person based on the prevailing level of blood sugar. So, this is a very common procedure that many patients uh, have to undergo uh, throughout their life and it is not a very comfortable process. So, one of the alternatives that one can think of is instead of a traditional needle, one can think of a micro needle, very small needle and the typical micro needle may be designed by mimicking the act of a mosquito's bite. This is called as biomimetics. Like this biomimetics, it, it does not mean that we just copy what is there in nature. It is impossible to copy what is there in nature, but we can get some lessons out of it. For example, when a mosquito sucks blood, it typically creates a suction pressure or negative pressure that draws blood into it into its mouth parts. So, you mimicking the above the sucking action in a micro needle may be provided by a micro electromechanical pump uh, and it can draw the blood very small volume of blood. Then uh, there can be uh, a testing of the blood in a let us for example, say a metal oxide based uh, semiconductor uh, 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 or MOSFET not a metal oxide semiconductor, but a MOSFET uh, based blood uh, glucose sensor. And then uh, based on that, uh, we can immediately get a result that whether uh, uh, or what is the amount of glucose 
that is there in the blood sample. So, that the MOSFET based sensor gives that answer and then based on that there can be a smart insulin delivery system and this entire process uh, can be built in a package which looks like a wrist watch which is shown uh, in uh, this view graph. So, this is just to say that one can have a, a small needle and the needle really can make sure that uh, you can have a very smart painless testing of blood sample to get the amount of glucose and deliver the insulin accordingly. Uh, how does it work? Uh, one of course is the uh, like creation of the suction pressure, but the design of the micro needle is based on the fact that in the micro scale, uh, in fact, mosquito's labium is also uh, of micrometer scale, like typical 25 micron to 50 micron diameter. And in the typical micrometer scale, surface tension works beautifully. There are certain forces which are not that uh, important in the large scale, but may be important in the small scale and surface tension is one such force. So, because of the surface tension working beautifully, the droplet of blood which is sucked from the bottom of the skin can be transmitted as easily with a very little indentation force and that makes the device to work in a painless manner. Fluid mechanics is often amazing. So, I, I can go on giving you examples, but I just do not want to uh, like overburden you with examples. I just want to let you uh, make you feel that fluid dynamics is not just the traditional automobiles or aircrafts or power plants or process plants that we can think of, but fluid dynamics is uh, just in all aspects of modern science and technology. And it is often amazing because many times it contradicts common intuition. Like rough surfaces may reduce frictional resistances against fluid flow instead of acting as hindrances. Without friction, birds cannot fly and fish cannot swim. Symmetric problems may have asymmetric solutions. Presence of particulate inclusions in a flow may reduce effective viscous nature of the fluid. A highly viscous flow may be a good simulator of ideal flows with zero viscosity. And time dependence of a flow depends on the choice of reference frame. Like you cannot say whether the flow is steady or unsteady until and unless you specify a reference frame. Shear force may vanish although shear stress may exist. So, these are a certain very interesting phenomena and many more which contradict common intuition. And this is what is important like from my perspective what I uh, can share my own uh, perspective or philosophy with you that all of us are born with certain intuitions like uh, even if you put even if there is a very little child who puts his or her finger in fire, he or she knows that it will burn. So, this is something which is which is intuitive and this intuition is correct. But while going through experience in life, one understands that there are many natural and, and physical phenomena which do not go by intuition. And then to get an explanation, explanation to that, to me that is the proper learning of science. So, I can give you a non-intuitive example that if we have rough surfaces, the rough surface is supposed to create more hindrance against fluid flow, but under certain cases it can be shown that the rough surface may reduce friction, not explicitly, but implicitly. What it can do that if you have a rough hydrophobic surface in a small confinement, then this surface can give rise to small bubbles, nanometer scale bubbles. And the liquid which is flowing on the rough surface is not directly feeling the effect of the rough wall. What it is doing? It is gliding on the cushion layer of the bubbles. So, uh, we can say that it is a rough that makes it smooth because the roughness of the surface is one of the key factors that has triggered the formation of these nanoscale bubbles. And the water, the liquid water that is moving on the, on the bubbles, uh, this is just flowing in an apparently frictionless manner because it is not interfacing with the rough surfaces directly. 
So, studying fluid mechanics we can give a perspective although this is primarily a theoretical course, but we will have several video demonstrations to make uh, like make it like a virtual experimental uh, environment, but we will be mostly discussing on theory and experiments and theory need to go together to learn for us to learn fluid mechanics and from the various examples that I have illustrated uh, my emphasis is that uh, like fluid mechanics can really be used to uh, understand uh, not just fundamental scientific issues, but to help towards the betterment of the society. Uh, this is the course outline that uh, we will be following. Uh, uh, I mean this is a tentative lecture wise uh, 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 breakup uh, and hopefully we will be able to uh, like uh, follow this breakup uh, uh, more or less what is indicated here and uh, uh, this is a standard fluid dynamics course. We will have a sort of crash course on fluid mechanics uh, toward uh, fluid machines towards the end of uh, this uh, introductory course of fluid uh, mechanics and we will be also having some lectures on compressible flows. So, the, the detailed uh, course structure is here and uh, we will be having a text document that will be shared with you uh, that contains the same information. And uh, we have a video reference for this course. So, uh, uh, many of the uh, videos that we will be demonstrating these are these are videos taken from a collection known as multimedia fluid mechanics published by the Cambridge University Press. And we acknowledge gratefully uh, uh, that uh, we are uh, happy to uh, like uh, show some of uh, the very interesting and uh, uh, like intriguing videos in the multimedia fluid mechanics. Uh, uh, we have already shown some of those in the introductory part of the uh, of, of this particular lecture, but uh, uh, there will also be several other chapters uh, where we will be showing various demonstrating various videos and in these various videos uh, and many of these videos are taken from the multimedia fluid mechanics published by the Cambridge University Press. So, uh, uh, with this little bit of uh, uh, introductory remark, uh, we will uh, move on to an issue which we want to discuss before discussing what is a fluid. Like in fluid mechanics, uh, the initial uh, discussion will typically always start with what is a fluid. It is a very involved question, but it is also important to understand that uh, uh, many times we have an intuitive idea of what is a fluid, but uh, like before that we will try to see that even if we know what is a fluid, question is what is the perspective in which we are going to analyze it, analyze the motion of it. Uh, to come into more concrete terms, we will consider a gas. When we consider a gas, we are definite that uh, like uh, it is a fluid, because there are certain substances, there are certain substances which fall in the interface of a fluid and a solid. So, we are not going into liquids uh, at this moment and we are just concentrating on gases, because all of us agree that it, uh, it, it, is, it is a fluid by uh, by the sense that uh, like uh, it, uh, it, it conveys to us from a common sense. Now, uh, let us say that there is a container in this container there are some gas molecules. Question is that how do we analyze this system? One possibility is that we write the equations of motion for each of these molecules. When we say that we are interested to write equations of motions for each of these molecules, think about a situation. Each molecule may have three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. That means, six independent equations for each molecule into the number of molecules. 
and the number of molecules think of just one mole and one mole really a small quantity will have Avogadro number of molecules. So, think of a realistic system. So, how many of unknowns you have and you will have this number of matching equations of motion and you have to solve for that to get a physical picture of the molecular motion. So, it is a fundamental way of analyzing the motion and is known as molecular dynamics, but one has to understand that it has practical limitations that it cannot really address a very large system. <coughs> it can address only a small system uh, with uh, 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 number of molecules not significantly large depending on the computational resources it may be thousands or more, but uh, it cannot be prohibitively large. So, what is the alternative? There are a couple of alternatives. One alternative is that instead of uh, addressing individual molecules, you can make a statistical average of many molecules. So, what you can do is uh, instead of directly uh, simulating the molecules, you statistically represent a group of molecules by statistical properties and that is what is commonly done in kinetic theory of gases. So, in kinetic theory of gases what you do, uh, uh, you address the behavior of a gas statistically and it is because you do it statistically you really do not have to simulate individual molecules in a real sense you have to just simulate the statistical behavior of molecules in a stochastic sense. So, that makes uh, the analysis computationally little bit more convenient uh, and that is known as a microscopic approach. that is known as microscopic approach. Now, uh, we have to understand that microscopic approach being convenient, it may carry some of its important implications. For example, if you want to uh, make a measurement. Let us say you want to make a measurement of pressure of a gas. So, microscopic approach really does not give you a clue of how to go about that. Instead of that you may have a more convenient approach, you just have a device which measures the time average normal force over a given area and divide the force by the area to get what is known as pressure. In the microscopic approach, you will find pressure because of as a consequence of change in molecular momentum as it encounters a collision. But in a macroscopic approach you just do not care about all those, but you just find time average force over a given area. So, that is called as macroscopic approach. If the macroscopic approach is working, then that is best for us because then you can treat the fluid as a continuous medium disregarding the discontinuities. So, you can think of that the fluid is like a continuous medium and the, that is known as continuum. And the hypothesis that tells that the fluid can be considered as a continuous medium disregarding the discontinuities inside following the macroscopic approach is known as continuum hypothesis. So, question is does the continuum hypothesis always work or it may not work. The thing is that the, if the continuum hypothesis works, it is the most convenient to use because we can use well known rules of differential calculus to calculate the gradients of properties. So, we can express the behavior through well known 
differential equations of uh, fundamental physics, classical physics to represent the proper property variations within the fluid. But the issue is that can we do it for all cases? Now to get a, a more detailed insight on that, let us say that we are interested to calculate the density of a gas. To calculate the density of a gas, what we need to do? We need to basically identify a elemental volume. We find out the number of molecules in that elemental volume. Let us say that small m is the mass of each molecule. So, this is the total mass divided by volume. So far so good, but how small the volume should be? To get a real point to point variation, this volume should be as small as possible, but not tending to 0. It can tend to a critical volume up to which the continuum hypothesis will be valid, not below that. Why not below that? Because then the interrogating volume may really have a very few number of molecules. If it has a very few number of molecules, then what will happen? Then uh, these molecules remember they are in random motion. So, what is going to happen is that let us say there is one, there are two molecules and suddenly one molecule is out of this. Which is, which is a very common thing that can happen. Then it can give rise to uh, an error like uh, which is like an 100 percent type of error that it, it can give rise to. So, or 50 percent type of error depending on how you are measuring the error. So, when you have this high percentage of error, when you have this high percentage of error, then that means that is because of the uncertainties in the molecular occupancy of the chosen interrogating volume. So, when can that happen? That can happen if the volume is very small or the volume may not be that small, but the system has a few number of molecules that is called as a rarefied system. So, we can understand that because of uncertainties uh, in a, uh, with regard to the number of molecules, when it has a large number of molecules, it is fine. But if, uh, if the volume has too large a number of molecules, then and if the volume is itself is large to handle that, then we do not get point to point variation of properties. So, what we really want is a small volume, but that should contain sufficient number of molecules and that means it is not a rarefied system. The next question comes, what is sufficient number of molecules? Well, how many number of molecules you say that it should be sufficient? Or uh, when do you say that the system is large or the system is small? When, when do you say that? To understand that, uh, we will come into more quantitative terms because smallness or largeness is qualitative. If we say that the system is small, you may say that it is small to you, but it is large to me. So, the, it is always important to make a quantitative ass assessment of the smallness or largeness. To, to understand that what we can do is we use one of the important quantities which is lambda. What is lambda? Lambda is the mean molecular mean free path. Molecular mean free path is what? Molecular mean free path is the average distance that a molecule will traverse before encountering a collision. So, that is the molecular mean free path. Now, a system is relatively rarefied if the molecular mean free path is large. That means, there are few molecules so that a molecule before encountering another collision has to traverse a large distance, but large and small as compared to what? So, we compare lambda with something called as L which is called as the characteristic length scale of the system.
So, what is a characteristic length scale? A characteristic length scale is a distance over which characteristic changes can take place. For example, like if you have a flow of gas through a pipe. So, you can see that characteristic changes take place from the wall where the velocity is 0 to the center line where the velocity is maximum. So, the characteristic length can be the radius of the pipe, but in engineering uh, typically it is considered as the diameter of the pipe with an understanding that it does not change the order like diameter is just 2 times the radius. So, uh, if we compare lambda with L, if lambda is large compared to L then we say that it is a rarefied system, but if lambda is small as compared to L we say that it is not a rarefied system. So, it is not just the lambda that is important, it is not just the L that is important, but lambda by L is a very important parameter that talks about the rarefaction of the system, rarefaction of the, rarefaction of the system. So, this is known as a non-dimensional number, this is the ratio of two lengths, so it is non-dimensional, this is called as Knudsen number. So, a small Knudsen number means the system is not that rarefied and continuum hypothesis can be used, but if the Knudsen number is large that means that the system has relatively uh, rare, uh, a relative rarefaction that means that continuum hypothesis cannot be used and one has to go for either statistical approach through microscopic approach or maybe molecular dynamics to analyze the problem. So, to summarize what we can say is that there are several approaches, one is the molecular dynamics approach to analyze the fluid flow and uh, which is uh, most intuitive, but computationally most challenging and there are uh, there is a compromise, one can go for statistically average behavior of many molecules which is the statistical mechanics approach. And the most convenient is the macroscopic approach based on continuum viewpoint where we consider the fluid as a continuous medium disregarding the discontinuities. And the continuum hypothesis can be used only under certain conditions typically governed by this Knudsen number. So, if the continuum hypothesis can be used then it is very convenient because we can use the well known rules of differential calculus for solving the problems. And, uh, because this is a very introductory course, we will be mostly dealing with fluid dynamics where continuum hypothesis can be safely used. So, we will be uh, uh, encountering situations and solving problems which we will address through the uh, use of continuum hypothesis. And uh, from the next lecture onwards, we will continue with the discussion with which we are leaving today and uh, thank you very much.